Today's scripture lesson takes us to the book of the prophet Ezekiel, Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14. We continue our journey through Advent with the prophets. And as God speaks through this prophet, listen for God's word for you and for our community. Ezekiel writes, The hand of the Lord came upon me, and God brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. God led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. God said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord, you know. Then God said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and I, as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered over them, but there was no breath in them. Then God said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. I prophesied as God commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet a vast multitude. Then God said to me, mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, we are cut off completely. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and you bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In our text, Ezekiel found himself in a valley of dry and dusty bones. This week, I found myself in what felt like a valley of dry and dusty boxes. Who here at some point over the course of this last week pulled dusty boxes of Christmas decorations out of their attic or out of their basement? Or maybe it was last week, because you're really on top of things. <laughs> Some years, I find this to be a really joyful activity. Some years, this is a really difficult activity. I think it's partially because each ornament, each decoration that we pull out of those dusty boxes can feel like a dusty memory. The popsicle stick crash that you made in first grade Sunday school. The glass ornament you bought on your honeymoon. The precious moments angel from your aunt who passed away this year. The porcelain teacup from your ex-mother-in-law. The embroidered or crocheted ornaments that you always thought were a little bit weird on your parents' tree but couldn't bear to throw them away when you were helping them downsize. Sometimes it is comforting to be surrounded by these dusty memories, and sometimes it is not. In our text for today, I suspect that the dusty bones and memories around Ezekiel were not comforting. At age 30, Ezekiel was taken into exile in Babylon. 
He was one of those folks in the group of exiles that I mentioned last week. One of those people to whom Jeremiah was writing his plan of hope. I don't know what Ezekiel thought about Jeremiah's letter as a plan of hope, but I am sure hope was hard for him, surrounded by his circumstances, having to relinquish control over his life and his plan for his life. You see, the same year that he was exiled was the same year he was supposed to be ordained a priest of Israel. So not only was he taken from his home, He also had the high and holy job he had been preparing for all his life taken away. Not being in Jerusalem meant no temple, meant no priest. For Ezekiel, this is further complexified by the suggestion from many commentators that Ezekiel is what we would consider neurodivergent. Meaning his brain worked, learned, expressed itself in different ways than what we would say is standard or typical. So for him, change to a setting or to a life plan was really extra hard. On top of that, other commentators also point out that he probably had some mental health stuff going on, brought on by trauma. Over the course of the book, we see capital T traumas in his life and lowercase t traumas. The big T trauma was probably the very disorienting experience of exile. And his little t traumatic events might have been the frequent incidents of a prophet feeling different, feeling unaccepted, realizing that he was unable to think or feel in the same way as those who are around him. Some people go so far as to give him the diagnosis of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, seeing symptoms in the way that he grapples on a regular basis with intrusive thoughts and images, extreme feelings, and the tendency to withdraw from others, and a propensity towards becoming confrontational and quite aggressive. And yet, even with PTSD, or maybe because of that PTSD, or maybe because he was neurodivergent, over the course of the first 30-ish chapters of this book, we watch as Ezekiel leans into his life in exile, just as Jeremiah recommended, and picks up the role, not of being a priest, but of being a prophet. Walter Brueggemann, one of my favorite commentators, explains that Psychologically speaking, the prophets are people who have an uncommon access to matters of God's will and purpose that seem to be hidden from other humans. That definition makes me wonder if there are more prophets in our midst than we realize, and if our world has just started to label them something different. As far as Ezekiel's experience of being a prophet... Up until chapter 33 of his book, things aren't great. It's hard for things to go great when you're navigating trauma and your job is to be extremely confrontational. But all that considered, and the fact that things are sort of picking up for him, he's getting some important attention. And at the same time, there seems to be a small glimmer of hope coming from Jerusalem. While the person that Nebuchadnezzar had set on the throne there in Jerusalem was not great, this puppet king was at least a descendant of David, so that meant there was the appearance that the Israelites might maintain some power. But then that all changes a couple chapters before our story. In the year 586, approximately 11 years into exile, Ezekiel and the other folks exiled in Babylon receive word that the king is gone, the city is fallen, the temple is destroyed. It is just a pile of rubble. Talk about a lot of dust. Dusty memories buried under yet another layer of dust. Same with hope. Hope buried in rubble. Trauma that compounds trauma. So it sort of makes sense that he has this vision about a dusty, bone-dry valley complete 
with skeletons. In this dusty vision, Ezekiel finds himself transported to a valley of dry bones with God. And there God speaks to him. God tells him three times to prophesy. He says, prophesy to these bones and say, thus says the Lord, the God, God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. In Hebrew, this term for breath is also the term for wind and spirit. It's all the same word, ruah. Commentators define this spirit as the irresistible force of God's presence and will in the world. And in the Christian tradition, we have come to connect this spirit to the Holy Spirit, the third person of our trinity. So with all this in mind, this combination between ruah, wind, breath, spirit, and dust, seems similar to another story many of us know. The creation story in Genesis. It's as if, in this vision, Ezekiel is a part of a re-creation. But what's interesting about this dream is how God, or this vision, is about how God goes about doing things in this vision. Back in the first account uh, in Genesis, the story of creation in Genesis 1, God chooses to do the work of creation by speaking, and all things, including humans, are created. Let there be humankind made in our own image. And there they were. Then in the second creation account in Genesis 2, God forms the first human from the dust of the ground. I always picture this as if God is making a human sand castle and then giving that sand castle CPR. The text said that God breathed into the human's nostrils and the breath of life and the dust became a living being. Here in Ezekiel, there are piles of dusty bones. And instead of laying them out in order and breathing into the nose socket, or instead of speaking and saying, let there be life, this is what God does. God says to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, mortal, you prophesy to these bones. God chooses to use the divergent and even trauma-stricken way Ezekiel is and presents himself in the world to bring about life. God could have chosen to do, chosen to do this God's self, but no. God chose to use Ezekiel and all of his experiences. Which is to say, if you don't hear me say anything else today, I hope you hear this, you don't have to be quote-unquote normal or even quote-unquote healthy for God to speak life through you. In fact, God chooses to use those of us who are a little neurodivergent and or a little scarred by the traumas of this world to breathe life into dry bones. This is so important to God that God thought it necessary through generations of folks of faith to canonize Ezekiel's words and wild visions, making them scripture. Having Ezekiel be the one to prophesy also struck me as somewhat parallel to something that therapists suggest as helpful for those who are navigating trauma. When someone has been navigating big T or little t traumas, therapists suggest that an important part of the journey toward a new way of doing life is that folks go through the process of reclaiming or re-symbolizing or re-narrating. Different theorists call it different things. But what it means is that the individual who experienced the traumatic event learns to retell the story or reframes their experiences to place the things that they have gone through in a wider context. They begin to frame their experiences, allowing them to no longer experience their memory as a victim. 
allowing them to take on another role. Maybe a compassionate observer, maybe a narrator, maybe a meaning maker. In God's call to Ezekiel to prophesy, it is as if God is inviting Ezekiel to do something along those lines. Ezekiel, who bears the scars of exile on his heart and mind, who probably feels as emotionally dry and dusty as the bones he is standing in the midst of, is invited by God to be the initiating agent in re-embodying these bones. And that's not where it ends. In the text, after Ezekiel prophesies to the bones, it says this, I prophesied, and as I had been commanded, and I, as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise. A rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them. Flesh had come upon them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then God said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, mortal, to the breath. So not only does Ezekiel talk to the dry bones to reframe and re-narrate the dusty memories and traumatic experiences, but he also is prophesying to that wind, breath, spirit. Ezekiel is invited to talk, to prophesy to God. When I think about prophecy, I typically think about it as something that is solely directed at humans, a word of God for humans. But here it is directed at the wind, the breath, the spirit, a word from God for humans, for God. Whether or not this was intended in this text, this little piece here reminds me that in these painful, dusty, traumatic moments, God wants to hear from us. In fact, God commands it. And through that, God, the Spirit, gives us what it takes to stand up. Through those conversations, we get what it takes to stand up. When Ezekiel prophesied to the breath, it says that they came to life, those bones, and stood up on their feet. So in this season... When we are surrounded by big T and little t traumas, when we are in the valley of the shadow of death, when we are going through dusty boxes of memories, God promises to meet us where we are at in our pain, in our trauma, in our divergent experiences, invites us to retell our story, recount our pain, and in so doing gives us a big breath of new life so that we can hold those dusty ornaments, those dusty memories in our hands, and maybe, just maybe, take the step to hang it on the tree and see the way that sometimes the things that feel or are dead can, with the breath of God, the dust blown off and hung in the constellation of Christmas lights sparkle with Christmas spirit, with the new and renewed resurrected life of the very Christ child we wait for. So as you put those ornaments up, as you find yourselves in that valley of boxes of maybe shadow of death or shadow of joy, may you remember Ezekiel's call. Gracious God, in the joy and in the sorrow, in the tinsel and in the porcelain teacup ornaments, in the crushes as in the cross, help us to see you, O oh God. Help us to speak to you out of whatever our circumstances are, trusting that no matter what happens, no matter our pain, no matter our differences or divergences, you will hear us and breathe new life through us. Amen. Mm -hmm.